Okay. Uh, I'm Paul Mankiewicz. I am not a soil scientist. As, as you probably um, picked up, I'm actually a developmental plant biologist, ecologist, and I have worked on building natural systems to clean our surroundings for quite a while. But before that, I worked on entirely self-contained microbiomes of the oldest living phyla of land plants, which is the bryophytes, the liverworts. Uh, probably their form is 430 million years old, and I actually cultured them with their mycorrhizal fungi, with a bunch of the bacteria they grow with, and also, of course, which I loved in the, the previous uh, presentation, the, the, in, the colonies always grow with the column balls and the rest. So it's just, I, I come out of that world and grew up with it. As I say, all my grandparents are from Central Europe, and I didn't know that you could actually throw away what you had already used, I thought, because it was something that could turn into soil. That's what we were supposed to do. My brother and I had no idea what garbage was until we were, probably were teenagers. Anyway, uh, I am a co-founder of uh, the Urban Soils Institute and uh, work with these guys on a, a bunch of things. Hey everyone, my name is Igor Bronze. I am, I guess, a geologist, hydrologist, um, um, engineer. Uh, I, I've done, uh, well, I've studied lots, lots of very, I guess, different things uh, r related to the environment. And um, one of my favorite parts is how it all comes together. Um, so uh, Paul and I, um, in addition to our work with USI, have a great technology company called Leaf Island. And um, we are doing work that uh, essentially brings the environment back into cities and, and get cities back into um, a sort of an environmental balance uh, by uh, bringing nature back. So um, uh, essentially the, the marketing term we like to use is uh, regenerating cities. So um, uh, th this presentation is going to discuss how we can save urban lakes by essentially uh, just using soil. Um, it sounds kind of funny, um, but uh, it, it, it's, it's a bit of a synthesis of, um, I think it was George actually who described earlier in, in this, uh, Meaning that, um, that 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 every speaker before us uh, had the sort of combination of um, uh, art and uh, and um, contaminated soils, br bringing humanity into um, into the environment, bringing education to the environment. Well, we're bringing the environment into the environment. Um, I know <laughs> it sounds funny. You'll see what I mean very soon. So uh, take it away, Paul. Good enough. Um, you know, I guess probably it's better to use simply one screen because otherwise my computer's going to get um, slowed down here. Yeah, thank you. Hold on, I'm going to just quit this. Um, quit my application so I don't lose all my bandwidth here. So if you can see uh, the screen here, it's a uh, basically a look at an urban landscape. So to the left, you have a aerial view of Van Cortlandt Lake. So Van Cortlandt Park, one of the most biologically diverse anywhere on the planet. It's um, uh, maybe twice the size of Central Park in the northern, north central Bronx, and a river runs through it. And when the colonists moved here, Van Cortlandt, obviously the Dutch colonists, they essentially made that into, as they did everywhere, the Dutch were masters of architecture. It made a difference for the energy of society and they would damn things so they had power. And they had to, of course, because that's how they made the lowlands into one of the most productive agricultural systems on the planet. And that's how they modified all of New York City. One fifth of it is fill over tidal marsh. And there's probably as much fill over wetlands, freshwater wetlands, that is something like 70 square miles in New York City. So what do you do? The exquisite green film, and you wouldn't be entirely wrong to call it a scum that you see, is because of exactly what Matt was describing. All the stuff we mobilize, but in this case, only two pieces of stuff, and that's phosphate and nitrate phosphorus and nitrogen. 
two limiting factors in the terrestrial biosphere. And you can take any lake, any water body, and turn it into turn it from the beautiful clear clear waters you saw in match pictures of those Montana lakes into this. Because biota is really there ready to grow and develop when limiting factors are taken away. But you don't want to simply take those limiting factors away. The reason there's trout in the Montana streams is because essentially it's oligotrophic. There are no nutrients. All the nutrients, limited as they are, get turned into plankton and they're captured by the caddisflies and stoneflies on the rocks that are then eaten by the trout and find their way into the, and the mayflies and find their way into the sky. That was the rule where most all of the minerals and materials flowing into a system were turned back into the biota. That's kind of the rule by which we all live. It's a, a sort of large frame for the golden rule, basically do unto others because everything is built by the multiple niches that fold in and across and surround and through one another. But you can poison them with too much. And that might sound to you and all of us like capitalism, and it is like the works parts of it, uh, capitalism doesn't need to be that way. It's just a matter of when people want more, they can actually let, make their lives much worse. And even wanting your children to be more clean can be bad for them. This is true for all of us. And it's certainly true in a number of ways for our, our water body because it's just that how much is enough? So there are freshwater mussels in this water body. And there used to be beaver throughout this whole landscape and beaver do something like what Igor and I are about to show you. That is to say, they basically stop the water, stand it out across a watershed so that it drops into the landscape. And when it does, that's essentially an investment in carbon capture in the future because everywhere on the land, there's only two elements that you need, so to speak, carbon and water. And then with sunlight and the macronutrients and micronutrients, that turns into light. That's all you need. Basically, from about 350 million years ago, when the aquatic biota walked its way onto land, this has been the process, and it isn't going to stop. Uh, and if we take our footprint off of it, it will continue at our own pace. The point is that basically much of the energy, something like, now not the lake itself here, although Igor and I will show you a way to bring the lake to life on the ecological productivity side. But you look at the trees in the background uh, in the picture on the right or in all around the lake. So you're looking there at a carbon capture capacity of something like a kilogram per square meter per year, a couple pounds. In the edge of the wetland, you have looking like something like two, three, four times that. And I'm telling you that because that's what creates the biota the life on the planet, the mass of life is absolutely tied to the mass of carbon capture. And the only way you can do that, because every part of the world is at some point, every part of the terrestrial landscape is some part of the day or year limited by water. Water is the fluid that controls the temperature all over, but controls the growth and development of everything. So you can see here, basically simply adding phosphorus and nitrogen because this is a three mile watershed. Part of it runs through a golf course, another part by Westchester lawns. So runoff, which is basically a man-made phenomena, like much of what Matt was showing you a bit ago, we have created it because ancestral landscapes, all of the water that lands on the land, except for the spring freshets, except, except when the ground is frozen, all of the water drops through the soil porosity into the groundwater and then enters the water bodies at something like 50 degree groundwater, exactly keyed to what the trout love. So next slide. Shows you a lake we built, Olmsted actually built it. This is Prospect Park, and you can see the Prospect Park's problem is not so much the watershed around it. It gets water from the city drinking water supply, and because of the concern, a real one, for lead, and USAID does a great deal of work on lead in soils, but lead in pipes can be dangerous, it depends entirely on the pH of the water in it. The pH is high, that is it's basic water, the lead will never come off. 
So the people in Flint were killed exactly because they shifted the water supply to an acid water and didn't add something like calcium carbonate or phosphorus, which would have actually saved lives. Uh, why people do this, I don't know. It's criminal, um, at least second degree murder, but they did it. Uh, but there's a way around it. We've known it for a very long time. Prospect Park is green, not because of runoff from the little moraine it's built on, but because it's got uh, orthophosphate added to the water. It's New York City drinking water makes that, that, that lake all together. And I, I patched in there a uh, basically a piece, which you maybe look later, but uh, essentially as you get to 100 parts per million, 90 parts per million phosphorus, lakes turn pea soup green. There's only two sinks for nitrate and phosphorus, okay? Uh, that is the soils and sediments and the biota. So every plant introduces you to the, if there's a plant around you, introduce yourself to her. She's about 15-ish percent nitrate, thereabouts. And rubiscus diphosphate is basically the carbon capture enzyme in every plant leaf of a certain sort. It's the most common protein on plant on the special landscape of planet Earth. So that's phosphorus. So that's nitrate. Nitrogen is a great deal of what plants are, and uh, it also, though, is essentially feedstock for a layer of the soil that does a critical piece of work of turning nitrogen, which is what organisms are made out of, back into nitrate gas, nitrogen gas, which is four-fifths of every breath you take, N2. So basically, it goes from being captured by microbes and by some of them associated with the bean family uh, plants uh, also, and also free-living bacteria. That is where it gets into the soil, and every living construction is made from it, and then there's a cycle to get it back. And luckily, that's simple, and Igor will show you in just a minute how one can get a great deal of nitrogen out with a constructed aesthetic. Phosphorus is more difficult because plants are only maybe one or two percent phosphorus, uh, three maybe. And so everybody you look at is some amount of it, but not so much. Basically, so all of the DNA, RNA, all that stuff, and all of the energy transducing molecules, uh, 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 basically ATP, adenosine triphosphate, they're all phosphorus in part, but it's just not a tremendous quantity. But there are every soil. In fact, all the all the beautiful clays that uh, Matt was showing you, those are desque oxides, which are basically these iron and aluminosilicates, and they hold phosphorus in great amounts under oxidizing conditions. So one could build a soil out of oxidized soil. Once it's reduced, once there's extra electrons, it's going to pop up and go into the solution. So the point is that this beautiful lake here. It will never filter itself, that is the Prospect Park Lake, and Van Cortland never can because we throw all the water in it and it flows down, you know, damn if uh, I'm not right in it, it flows downhill. And the problem is the way we're failing is because the filters that could do this work, the plants themselves, the soils themselves, are decoupled. They're not, it used to be that all rainwater went through the soil, the roots went down into the moving groundwater, pulled up the phosphorus and nitrogen, and basically you had water that the brook trout could love. It's not really a trout, it's actually a char, but that's okay. She's just as beautiful. So that's, as opposed to the rainbows out in the uh, in mass country there, that's basically what you get. You're guaranteed 50, 55 degree water with nothing in it if it runs through groundwater. If it runs from lawns that people, just like your art, arts people having these competitions, green lawn is basically a meaningless aesthetic because it used to be tied to sheep and to literally the livelihood of people. No more. Now it's just some competition and it guarantees pollution. But we can still beat that because there is the largest biogeochemical filter on planet Earth surrounding us and in all places. It's the soil largest by orders of magnitude, far huge enough to pull out all the phosphorus on the planet and more, hundreds of times that, thousands of millions of times that, and basically um, one piece on terminal electron acceptors because uh, George makes me talk about this all the time. So all of us uh, are essentially 
run by oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. So there's a part of a volt drop of the energy of an electron in a carbohydrate to oxygen. So that's a, the biggest drop because of the huge energy. You can, you can prove this to yourself by taking a carbohydrate like a match, striking it, and you'll notice it burns because the oxygen is basically firing that CO2, that carbon, <clears throat> carbon, 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 hydrogen bond into flame and heat <clears throat> and the release of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So on top <clears throat> in the soil, there's the <clears throat> oxygen internal electron acceptor. Right under that, there's a group of bacteria, some of my favorites, pseudomonads, and that's sort of the facultative zone. We'll let that go for a second. Below that is a layer. Now, now there's no oxygen, but there's bacteria, the denitrifiers, that basically take nitrate, and when they have enough carbon, they break that into parts and airmail nitrogen gas back into the atmosphere. So in other words, they remove nitrate from the water column. Below that, there's sulfate reducers and there's eventually carbon dioxide itself is reduced and that's where methane is produced, but we don't need to pay to focus on that. But that right, that black layer of muck you see, right a millimeter underneath that, there are a million trillion denitrifiers and there's a lot of them that are out of work. And Igor is going to show you in a second a way to put them back uh, uh, to give them employment. This is basically a uh, uh, rebuild it better program, but we're doing it at the microbial scale. Igor. Hey, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Paul. Um, now let's get into some um, complex uh, figures. And uh, uh, I know this is a great time, you know, late in the evening on a Thursday. We can start looking at some um, at some complicated drawings. So, so let's start with a, a simple one, and then we'll move to the to the less simple ones. So, um, there are two sites in Van Cortlandt Park where we are building our models, and uh, thanks to the Van Cortlandt Park Alliance, Department of Parks and Recreation, and um, the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality, we were able to fund two pilot wetlands that are going to take this pea soup green lake water full of phosphorus and nitrogen and turn it into um, water that has a lot less phosphorus and nitrogen. And uh, this is site number one. This is a fairly small site next to the Van Cortlandt Lake House. And um, essentially what we are trying to do is uh, basically peel back this coastline, sculpt it so that we can carve some channels into it. And these channels um, will then will, will be windy enough where they will allow the lake water to enter at, at, from one side of this site through a pump, um, wind through through the channels, and uh, in the process, the uh, the phosphorus and nitrogen will be removed because uh, just through the soil itself, through the various um, sesquic oxides contained in the soil. Um, basically oxidizing and, and capturing that phosphorus. And of course the plants, the wetland plants will be growing on top of this site. Um, so I know it's hard to imagine. So let's take a look. Um, this is essentially a uh, drawing on the left side is what the site looks like right now. And on the right side is what we plan to make it look like. So uh, on one side, we, we have um, a pump a solar pump coming in, taking the water that goes through into a sedimentation reservoir, removing a lot of the solids so they don't get gunk up the, um, the system. And then the water essentially travels through the soil into, into these switchback channels that will uh, eventually bring the water back to the lake in much cleaner form. And in the process, you can see these arrows that are just showing how the water infiltrates into the soil as it's um, as it's uh, moving through the channels. And um, this is, uh, so this is essentially an inexpensive way to, to, to clean the lake. It works every day, as long as the pump functions, then, then this functions, even, even without the pump, it would still do something. Um, and the, the purpose of this is really is to demonstrate a, an inexpensive way to clean um, urban lakes um, of, uh, of uh, algae bloom so that they're no, no longer eutrophic. Um, and if, if successful, this project will essentially be um, implemented at a much larger scale um, 
because uh, as it stands, this is a very small site. It's about 20 by 20. Um, it's not going to clean the entire lake. But if you were to scale this as, as all green infrastructure should be scaled, um, if you were to scale this to maybe an entire side of the lake, then we can start seeing some, some very real change. You can start seeing some balance of the nutrients coming in from, through the watershed, through Tibbetts Brook, and them coming out and into the wetland where um, they'll, be, they'll be properly utilized. And the drums at the bottom just show um, uh, kind of a side view. It's, it's, it's somewhat exaggerated, and, uh, but it's, it's really just to demonstrate how the, the, the roots and the, um, newly, uh, and, the, and the newly sculpted landscape work together to, um, to, to, to filter this water. Um, so I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to move on to our next site because it's also going to be um, probably even more complicated. So site number two is to the north part of Van Corland Lake. And th this site is much larger, so I don't have a, 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 great, a good picture of it because it's heavily wooded and it's about 250 feet long from the, from the uh, north side to the south side. Um, and this site was more interesting because it doesn't really have a soil layer. So it's kind of just heavily wooded, uh, very mucky, just all mud. It floods all the time. And there isn't really much soil there because if you, if you dig down, um, you, you're going to basically hit rock. So um, how do we filter lake water if we don't have any um, uh, how do we filter it through soil? There is no soil, right? So the idea here is that we're going to construct berms that move along topography. And these berms will essentially um, be constructed from, uh, inside there'll be a concrete core, uh, just, just to keep the berm stable, um, made from recycled reinforced concrete, then a layer of gravel, then a layer of sand, and then a layer of compost or mulch cover, covering the top of it. And then, uh, then water we pump from the lake, if you, if you can follow my cursor, um, all the way up to the, to the top of this, um, to the top of the site into a shallow reservoir where the water will then flow down braided streams um, that, that pass perpendicular to the burns. So, um, and then another um, interesting feature is that we intend to take a third of this site and turn it into a high pH fed wetland that, that removes, um, that essentially uh, removes nutrients and creates a different type of biodiversity um, uh, just with a, through a higher pH. So it should work in a slightly different way. Um, and uh, this will be constructed using um, a, a, a supplement of concrete chips because as we know, concrete is made of calcium carbonate, which, uh, raise, uh, which would dissolve the raise of the pH. So um, here we go. Uh, I hope this is uh, I hope this is uh, visible to everybody. But essentially, again, on the left side, you see um, the existing conditions. You have our site here. We have some topograph uh, some topographic lines. We have the trail, and we have the golf course next door, which aren't we aren't going to touch yet. We'll we'll get to the golf course eventually, and. On the right side, you can kind of see how these how these streams would look like. Um, so uh, the pump brings water from the lake up about nine feet, and it would flow down from the reservoir down down grade through these berms constructed here. And it's a bit color coded, so you can see on the left side, um, this is where the fern um, the the fen excuse me will go. Um, at a higher pH, so there'll be a more of a concrete supplement to the berms here. And on the right side, there'll be more of a, of a typical wetland found in, uh, in this area. Um, and there's also a sub, uh, more of a supplement of um, just uh, various aggregates inside the streams themselves, especially in the high energy areas where the streams are widest. And uh, th this would um, just provide additional filtration uh, capacity. And on the left side, where it's higher pH, the same, uh, the same um, I guess stream fill would be uh, concrete rather than regular gravel. 
And on the bottom here, you can see the profile view. This, sh this should sort of um, provide a better understanding of how it would look. So um, water, uh, now just keep in mind that this pipe that goes to the top of the, of the site, it's not underground. It's just kind of drawn this way so it doesn't get in the way of the other, um, the other features. So lake water is pumped from the lake up nine feet into the reservoir. And as you can see, the water starts encountering burns the entire way down. Um, and, uh, and it has no choice but to pass through the burns. So it, it, as it passes through them, it, you get filtration. And then there'll also be, uh, there's also vegetation all over the place. So that's another important thing to know is that, to notice is that there will be a, a lot of biology happening here. Um, so it, it should pass down. There should be a burn about every foot or so on the topography until it eventually gets back to the lake, hopefully much cleaner than before. Um, so, uh, so we will be working on this project, pro hopefully uh, this either in late November or in December of this year. So it's gonna be moving quick. And this site, site two is actually going to be the first site we're working on um, because we're just waiting on a few other um, documents before, uh, before we can begin. Um, so I hope everybody got that. I, I, I know this is a lot for um, <laughs> right now. Um, so th this is essentially us trying to create a method of, of soil filtration um, when you don't have any soil, right? Um, but uh, essentially, the, when, when I mentioned earlier that we're bringing um, the environment back into the environment, what I meant was we, we are bringing, um, we are essentially trying to create an interface between um, between the edge and, um, and, and, the, and the water itself. And this last slide is just gonna give you an idea of uh, what it means to create an interface. So this, this um, the top uh, image is the East River Park rendering by the uh, New York City Department of Design and Construction. And it, it looks like your typical modern day, um, like a uh, pseudo green park where uh, you have your, um, your grass, a couple of trees. And, and what, what really got me about this is that they built these embayments, which are um, essentially just a bunch of rocks. Uh, throw, uh, and, and the idea be, be behind these embayments was that you want, uh, they wanted to um, bring visitors closer to nature. Well, I don't know, I'm not seeing any nature around here in my mouse is, I'm just seeing a bunch of rocks. So, um, so uh, I essentially constructed a, uh, I Photoshopped this design because they already have the embayments to spec. So why not turn these embayments into actual, um, into actual wetlands with muscle beds and grass? Um, why not duplicate the design so you can create this living shoreline, uh, an, an interface between the water and the, and the land? Um, it's, uh, the design's already there. It, they've already approved the, this embayment. So why not just add, um, add not boulders, but sand and silt and create, um, and create a wetland environment that actually produces, uh, that actually has ecological value, not just bare rock. So, um, so that's it for us. And uh, I, don't, I know it's already getting late. So uh, thank you for listening.